All right, I'm going to begin here. We're looking at book four of Paradise Lost, uh, the first uh, scene in which we see the human pair of Adam and Eve and uh, the entry of Satan into the world for the first time. Remember, the first uh, three books were dealing with, uh, first two with, with hell and uh, and its occupants, the third with heaven, and there's a sort of a, a framing uh, throughout, a structure throughout it. And I suggest it's that in book, uh, book uh, four, uh, Satan will enter the world. In uh, book nine, he will uh, again come into the, the garden. So four books from the end. And, um, but what I wanted to do by looking at this today is to look at uh, something, uh, not just because it's in the epic, but something we have uh, probably need to look at, which is Milton's view of mankind. And uh, the reason I say that is because we have certain views of human nature that we have inherited from just culture, our culture, and certain assumptions about mankind in, his er in its early origins, uh, very much influenced by uh, the Romantics, uh, an idea of the noble savage, and so forth. Um, Rousseau speaks in such terms, and uh, to some degree that is the sort of default position of Western culture to this day, is the innocence, the primal innocence of mankind, and, um, and the, uh, the uh, it's contrary, which is the effect of civilization, which is uh, corrosive and to some degree degrading and degraded. And those are the two counterpoints that the Romantics see culture in, either the naive innocence and goodness of man or the uh, rational, uh, detached, in some ways, uh, hostile viewpoint of modernity. Um, it's interesting to me that those arise out of the premises of Cartesian science. Uh, I, I connect it very closely to the cogito and the view of human nature intrinsic to that, which is the idea that our nature is, uh, that we uh, fundamentally think ourselves into existence. That's a way of putting it. Because remember, Descartes' method of doubt uh, is uh, such that he doubts everything that he can't doubt. I d he doubts everything he can't be certain of. And that comes down to the point of he, he, he doubts everything except the fact that he's doubting. He knows that. And if he's doubting, that means he's thinking. And if he's thinking, he says that he must exist. And if he exists, then he can imagine, easily imagine a being infinitely superior to him um, that he will call God. And so from the, that basis, so as I say, he literally thinks himself into existence. That's the starting point. And to some degree, it's the satanic starting point. I don't think they're entirely the same, but there's some degree of the mind is its own place and in and itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. What matter where I be if I be still the same? It doesn't matter where I am because the mind is its own place. And... Um, with that view, um, it's actually thinking that makes us fall. And the view of primitive mankind, which such as we'll see in the garden then, is a thoughtless mankind. Noble, good, but not really yet capable of rational thought. And that's the view of language that we find in the uh, 18th century in Rousseau and uh, a German writer by the name of Herder, H-E-R-D-E-R, -E -E on the origins of uh, language. And they posit the idea that uh, early language began in primitive grunts and cries and gradually became more and more sophisticated, developed, nuanced, articulated, and uh, talks about then as sort of an anthropological development of uh, of of mankind that goes along with language. So with the language that becomes more and more articulate and pointed, we get 
um, uh, expressions of awe and wonder. So the first expressions are fundamentally poetic, but also fundamentally theological. And that gives way then to the philosophical mind of the Greeks, uh, Socrates and company. And that in turn gives way uh, eventually to the uh, scientific mind. Uh, and the scientific mind uh, is far more articulate. It points to things, it names things, and it um, differentiates and distinguishes and to some degree distance itself from things. It names this and I am not this, I am not that. So that's the account that we get. And so we get this idea that uh, furthermore that the best poetry is primitive, spontaneous, natural. These are the uh, terms that are used in the 18th century aesthetic vocabulary. And it, it is said that the earliest literature is the closest to nature, it's more humane, it's more expressive, it's more passionate. Whereas our age, we're not capable of poetry, we are capable of articulation, but we're, we're to some, dis some degree distracted from it. So this account of anthropology is very common uh, after the Enlightenment. And in fact, it's the default way of looking at it. to this very day. People like primitive because they, th they associate goodness and naturalness and passion, etc., with it. With that account, account in mind, then we go to the Genesis text and we find that it doesn't actually fit that description at all. I'll put this up on the screen here for you. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And so the Lord God causes the deep sleep to fall on Adam, takes one of his ribs, closes the flesh in its place, and forms woman out of that. Brought her to the man, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then there's a comment that seems almost unrelated. It's an editorial comment. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, etc. A lot going on there, but what you note, and the reason I, I read this here, is that Adam's already naming things. And in the naming, we see something about Adam that contradicts the view of Rousseau, uh, the Enlightenment, the Romantics, and... Uh, language development to this day, including our sensibilities about that. And that is that Adam was a, if for lack of a better word, a scientist. He knew things in their nature when he named them. He had the capacity for speech, for rational thought. It was not a fallen aspect of him. It was not an accident of his nature. It was intrinsic to his nature. It's what it means to be a person. To be a person is uh, what the church fathers describe as to be made in the image of God. It's to be a person because God is personal, tri-personal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? These are the three persons of the Trinity. We are made in his image, Genesis 126. Therefore, we are also persons. What does that actually mean? Well, uh, in the patristic period, Boethius says that is to be a, uh, an individual substance of a rational nature. It sounds very abstract. But it's, no, it's an individual. It's not part of a group. It's not a group identity. There's not a herd. Adam's not part of a herd. He's an individual, and he has, the, he has a rational nature. He names things, 
and he understands them. And that is also corroborated when we go to other texts, such as uh, John 1, where it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And the word wor word there is logos, which has connotations of both the word and reasoning from which we get logical, right? And Jesus is the image of God. So lots of stuff going on there. I say all that because we come to the text immediately expecting certain things about Adam and Eve and we find that Milton disappoints us or surprises us. And what he is doing here, and this is from C.S. Lewis's preface to Paradise Lost, commenting on this when talking about Adam and Eve, is just following Christian tradition on it, which is following the biblical text, as far as I'm concerned. So I'll, I'll read. Adam was from the first a man in knowledge as well as in stature. So he didn't just look like a man. He wasn't just in, uh, standing on two feet. He wasn't just the naked ape. He wasn't just a noble savage. He was a man in knowledge. He alone of all men has been in Eden in the garden of God. He has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He was endowed, says Athanasius, with a vision of God so far reaching that he could contemplate the eternity of the divine essence and the cosmic operations of his word. That's Athanasius from which we get the Athanasian Creed. He was a heavenly being, according to St. Ambrose, who breathed the ether and was accustomed to converse with God face to face. His mental powers, said St. Augustine, surpass those of the most brilliant philosopher as much as the speed of a bird surpasses that of a tortoise. If such a being had existed, and we assume that he did before we can read the poem, then we are in for a shock. So, I'll move away from that. But just to note, that is Milton's view of man. As we, and not just man, in the sense of Adam, Eve will have the same endowments. So we find two individuals who are superior to us not just in their form they're not more just more beautiful they're more intelligent they're more just they have greater knowledge and this is consistent with milton remember he says the aims of education the purpose of education is to restore the ruins of our first parents so there's been something lost of that ability of Adam to understand things in their nature. So with that said, let's look at book four, Paradise Lost. I think it's important to say that though. So the, the argument, as I say, Satan now enters into the garden for the first time. In book nine, he'll do it for the second time. But Milton does this here not just to create a structure, but to introduce, to show us something about human nature. It's such an important part, like he's really just telling us the account of Genesis 1 to 3. And so much, there's so much importance in those uh, passages to the creation of mankind. He can't just skip over it and go to the fall. He wants to look at the full dignity of humanity. And so this is really important, book four, for establishing that. When he comes to book nine, he's going to deal with the temptation and the fall, but he wants to first of all, give us a, a sense of what it must have been like to see Adam and Eve, the awesome nature of Adam and Eve. So again, the argument, the argument, Satan now in prospect of Eden and nigh the place where he must now begin the bold enterprise, which he undertook alone against God and man, falls into many doubts with himself and many passions, fear, envy and despair, but at length confirms himself in evil journeys on to paradise whose outward prospect and situation is described, overleaps the bounds, sits in the shape of a cormorant on the tree of life, as highest in the garden to look about them. And then the garden and his sight of Adam and Eve. But first I want to get to that book four, because this is the first sight that Satan has of the created order and of mankind. And the first sight is telling, and it's telling not just about what he sees in them, but how he reflects on them and what, he, uh, what his reaction says about his previous boasting. Remember he said that the mind was its own place and it didn't matter where he was. No matter where he was, he was sovereign because he could think whatever he wanted to think. There was no control over his thoughts. He had total control over that. But Milton begins with a, a note of 
an ominous note. Oh, for that warning voice, which he who saw the apocalypse heard cry in heaven aloud. Then when the dragon put to second route came furious down to be revenged on men. Woe to the inhabitants on earth that now while time was our first parents had been warned the coming of their secret foe and escaped happily so escaped his mortal snare for now satan now first inflamed with rage came down the tempter ere the accuser of mankind to wreak on innocent frail man his loss of that first battle and in his flight to hell Yet not rejoicing in his speed, though bold, far off, and fearless, nor with cause to boast, begins his dire attempt, which nigh the birth now rolling boils in his tumultuous breast, and like a devilish engine back recoils upon himself. Horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him, for within him hell he brings and round about him, nor from hell one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place. Now conscience wakes despair that slumbered, wakes the bitter memory of what he was, what is and what must be worse. Of worse deeds, worse sufferings must ensue. Sometimes towards Eden, which now in his view lays, lay pleasant, his grieved look he fixes sad, sometimes towards heaven and the full blazing sun, which now sat nigh high in his meridian tower, then much revolving thus in size began. So note Milton already, this is the editorial comment that hell comes wherever Satan is, because there, there's something about, and hell is to some degree, it is a place, but he's left that place. And we get an expansion then of what hell actually means. And we see that it is, in some sense, metaphorical. And yet the metaphor seems to be a more accurate description than, than the place itself. Because the place itself is as far from God as can possibly be. Right? And there's no light there. And yet, even when he comes into the light, he gets no closer. And the reason why is because his distance from God is a relational distance. It's not a physical distance per se, although the physical distance is part of that. It's a geographical depiction of that distance and hostility and enmity. But even when he gets into the precincts of light on earth, he is still distanced from God and he is therefore in hell because to view God is to be in delight. And so now when he looks on Eden, the garden of pleasure, he will find no pleasure, but rather torment. And so there's something about his proud boast to the, for the mind to be its own place, which immediately shows itself to be false and wrong. So there's so many levels on which you need to read Paradise Lost. There is, so this might, we might call it a psychological level, for lack of a better word but it's more of a relational. But, the, and, but note the torment that comes from this and Satan looking at something that's good uh, is not consoled by it in any way, as we might expect uh, if it were the case that he had full sovereignty over his thoughts, but we already know that he does not. That too is a boast. He's not sovereign over himself. He's actually uh, still the Lord's servant, like all creatures. Not that he's doing the Lord's will, but the Lord will overrule his choices and act and bring goodness out of evil. But he begins by looking at the sun. That's where we left off here. The full blazing sun in his meridian tower. So it's, in, it's at noon at its height, very sunny and bright. And so he, remember we left off back in book, th book three with Milton, uh, speaking in heaven in his blindness and talking about hailing the light, offspring of heaven firstborn. Here now he sees the physical manifestation of that, which is the sunlight, and says this, O thou, that with surpassing glory crown. In some ways, Milton's Satan is very much the opposite of Milton 
the poet. Milton has spiritual eyes. Satan seems to have physical eyes but lacks spiritual eyes. He's blind, spiritually blind. He, he sees in God a being he hates and everything that reflects God's goodness likewise he hates. O thou that with surpassing glory crown look, looks from thy sole dominion like the God of this new world at whose sight all the stars hide their diminished heads. To thee I call, but with no friendly voice, and add thy name, O son, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere, till pride and worse ambition threw me down, warring in heaven against heaven's matchless king. And now we get a temporary moment of reflection, if not remorse. Ah, wherefore? He deserved no such return from me, whom he created what I was in that bright eminence, and with his good upbraided none, nor was his service hard. What could be less than to afford him praise, the easiest recompense, and pay him thanks? How do and there's a little bit of Smeagol Gollum here, so it's Smeagol. The good, the good, and then the bad. Ah, uh, how do? Yet all his good proved ill in me, and wrought but malice. Lifted up so high, I stained subjection and thought. One step higher would set me highest, and in a moment quit the debt immense of endless gratitude, so burdensome still paying, still to owe, forgetful what from him I still received, and understood not that a grateful mind by owing owes not, but still pays, at once indebted and discharged. What burden then? Oh, had his powerful destiny ordained me some inferior angel, I had stood then happy, Smeagol. No unbounded hope had raised ambition. Gollum, yet why not? Some other power as great might have aspired, and me, though mean, drawn to his part. Smeagol, but other parts as great fell not, but stand unshaken from within or from without to all temptations armed. Hadst thou the same free will and power to stand? Thou hadst. Whom hast thou then, or what to accuse? But heaven's free love dealt equally to all. Gollum, be then his love accursed, since love or hate to me alike, it deals eternal woe. Smeagol, nay, cursed be thou, since against his thy will chose freely what it now so justly ruse. Me, miserable, which way shall I fly? Infinite wrath and infinite despair. Which way I fly is hell. Myself am hell. And in the lowest deep, a lower deep still threatening to devour me, opens wide, to which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. Smeagol, oh, then at last relent. Is there no place left for repentance? None for pardon left? Gollum, none left but by submission, and that word disdain forbids me, and my dread of shame among the spirits beneath, whom I seduced with other promises and other vaunts than to submit, boasting I could subdue the omnipotent. I, me, they little know how dearly I abide that boast so vain, under what torments inwardly I groan, while they adore me on the throne of hell, with diadem and scepter high advanced, the lower still I fall, only supreme in misery. Such joy ambition finds. But say I could repent and could obtain by act of grace my former state. How soon would height recall high thoughts? How soon unsay what feigned submission swore? Ease would recant vows made in pain as violent and void. 
For never can true reconcilement grow where wounds of deadly hate have pierced so deep, which would but lead me to a worse relapse and heavier fall. So should I purchase dear short intermission brought, bought with double smart? This knows my punisher. Therefore, as far from granting he as I from begging peace. All hope excluded then. Behold, instead of us, outcast, exiled, his new delight mankind created, and for him this world. So farewell hope, and with hope, farewell fear, farewell remorse. All good to me is lost. Evil be thou my good. By thee at last, at least divided empire with heaven's king, I hold by thee. And more than half, perhaps, will reign as man ere long in this new world shall know. Thus while he spake, each passion dimmed his face, thrice changed with pale ire, envy, and despair, which marred his borrowed visage and betrayed him counterfeit, if any eye beheld. For heavenly minds from such distempers foul are ever clear, whereof he, soon aware, each perturbation smoothed with outward calm, artificer of fraud, and was the first that practice falsehood under saintly show, deep malice to conceal, couched with revenge. Fantastic speech, right? So what we get is the flipping back and forth of Satan, just thinking, is there any way, any way out? And there's a, there's a rational dialogue within his head. How could I do this? I could do this, but that wouldn't work. And this, how about this? Nope, 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 yes. Paradise Lost? Yeah, sorry, Paradise Lost. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's like, because it reflects the reader's emotions so much, especially if you're reading it as an unbeliever, I think you should read it. I, I, th I think so, especially if you read it well. Like, with it, it, it I, I forefront of the Smeagol Golem there, just to give you a sense, I want two sides, like, and you remember that in the way it was portrayed in the film version of The Lord of the Rings. And even they named it two different characters. Well, here it's just one. But there is a sense of, hey, maybe there's a better way, uh, a way out of this, and then no, absolutely not. And he keeps going back and forth to the point where he's then resolved, I will do this. And I do think that Milton may have been taking, or rather Tolkien may have been taking his portrait of Smeagol Gollum from this, this scene um, with, with significant differences, obviously. But there, there is a turmoil within the character which he's reflecting and again reflects the contradictions of the sinful mind and the perverse logic now remember there are differences between satan and, and a human being and that it, and milton's already articulated them in book three of paradise lost which is that the first uh that fell were spirits and they fell of their own accord self-depraved and that's why there can be no redemption for them Whereas mankind was deceived and therefore they will receive grace. Pronounced right from the outset, but there's a, a direct, so it's not possible for Satan to receive redemption. There is no uh, grace possible for him. He's foreclosed it. He, he brought himself down. So there's a distinction there. Now, he does not know that, by the way, that, that mankind could be redeemed even. Although he does know that God will not allow him to succeed. So there's something of a, a, an inkling of that. But he, he does not enter into his mind what God could do. Because again, he's a proud spirit. And Christ will humiliate himself, humble himself in the form of a man. To take on God's wrath at mankind's sin. Again, would never enter. Because remember, Satan said to be weak is miserable doing or suffering. To be weak is miserable. Christ will become weak and suffer and thereby exhibit God's strength over Satan's apparent victory. Right? He will redeem us from sin and death. And so he then resolves to resolves to do what he set out to do to begin with. And he is, however, seen by this one angel by the name of Uriel, 
Uriel is a heroic figure. We will, see, we will meet him again in uh, books five and six. Book five where Uriel will stand against, uh, initially he'll be in the one third of the angels that are against God. He's just, he's just part of the crowd there and then he realizes what's at stake and he stands out on his own. He, he doesn't go with the, the crowd. He stands literally a solitary figure speaking against that. Some see, uh, have even suggested that, that Uriel is Milton's hero. I, I think he's too minor a character for that, but still. Uh, he is Milton's, he's certainly a heroic type for Milton to stand on his own and brave the consequences of doing so. But Uriel sees Satan and his perturbations, whose eye pursued him down the way he went, and on the Assyrian mount saw him disfigured. More than could befall spirit of happy sort, his gestures fierce he marked, and mad demeanor, then alone as he supposed, all unobserved, unseen. So on he fares, into the border comes of Eden, where delicious paradise now nearer crowns with her enclosure green. So he comes there, I'm going to skip over this a little bit, jumps over the wall of paradise and into the garden and sees the delights there in the garden and is uh, reflects on it. I'll skip over this and he skips over and he lands and interestingly on the middle tree. So so clomb this first grand thief into God's fold. So since into his church lewd hirelings climb. Milton making a little bit of a reference. Um, application, if you will. Contemporary application. Thence up he flew and on the tree of life, the middle tree and highest there that grew, sat like a cormorant. And again, the cormorant is a particular type of bird. It's a, bo it's a bir bird of prey. And he, set, he, he perches on that. Now, in, in scripture, it talks about the cross as the tree of death. But the tree of death will, give, will be the means by which Christ will give us life. Now, the cormorant sits on the tree of life and he will bring us death. So again, Milton is cleverly playing on the symbols that scripture himself gives us, itself gives us here. And as he clarifies, yet not true life thereby regained, but sat devising death to them who lived, nor on the virtue thought of that life-giving plant, but only used for prospect. He didn't even try and eat of the tree of life. Remember, we're gonna, we know already from the Genesis text that uh, once Adam and Eve eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he then casts them out lest they eat of the tree of life. They're not so something good would have come from that. Satan is on the tree of life and he doesn't even think to eat of it because virtue is far from his thoughts. So life is connected to virtue there and goodness in Milton's reckoning at any rate. He only used it for prospect. What well used had been the pledge of immortality. So little knows any but God alone to value right the good before him but perverts best things to worst abuse or to their meanest use. Beneath him with new wonder now he views to all delight of human sense exposed in narrow room nature's whole wealth, yea more, a heaven on earth for blissful paradise of God the garden was by him in the east of Eden planted. And he will then describe this and see the next to the tree of life and the vegetable gold he describes the tree of uh, our death the tree of knowledge fast by knowledge of good bought dear by knowing ill remember in area pagetica the helpful footnotes here it's the one of the ways in which we uh, are educated by experience. We know good to some degree by experiencing evil. It's a contrast, which is why pantheism is so wicked, because it suggests that good and evil are just a matter of perspective. They aren't actual 
things and you could what what in this situation was good at one point might become evil in another situation so there's no absolute good and evil absolute distinction between them so he goes along that and he will see mankind now where will i pick that up uh Yes, let's come to a site of Eve. Nature boon, the birds knew. And sees a crystal mirror, unite their streams, the birds, their choirs, apply airs, vernal airs, breathing the smell of field and grove, attune the trembling leaves while universal pan, knit with graces and the hours in Dance led on the eternal spring, not that fair field of Enna, where Proserpine, Proserpine, daughter of Zeus, gathering flowers herself, a fairer flower by gloomy dis was gathered. This is a uh, an, a uh, reference to a myth that Mil Milton will use in Book Nine as well. A fair flower, Eve herself is the fair flower. And we find that there is a storm by her. And here it's Pluto. Pluto is, of course, the god of the underworld. Satan's being compared to the god of the underworld because, of course, he's come from the underworld. And all of that, so forth. And he will see two of living creatures new to sight and strange, two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike, erect. not just in reference to their stature, in reference to their intellect, in reference to their character. And, and we need to recognize this again in modern anthropology, they simply describe physical external characteristics. They don't describe moral uh, standing. They don't describe rational things because you can't actually empirically observe them because they're invisible. You can observe them insofar as they have this capacity which is clearly distinctive. But again, that's not a scientific observation, at least not according to the terms of modern science. So they are erect in this sense, however, with native honor clad in naked majesty seem lords of all and worthy seemed. For in their looks divine, the image of their glorious maker shone. Truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure. Severe, but in true filial freedom placed whence true authority in men, though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed. For contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace. He for God only, she for God in him. His fair large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule and highest synthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. So he had long hair, but not too long. Didn't go below his shoulders. It's like there. She, a veil down to the slender waist, her unadorned golden tresses wore disheveled. So Eve had blonde hair. But in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, but required with gentle sway and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride and sweet reluctant amorous delay. Nor, were, nor those mysterious parts were then concealed. They're both naked, right? Then was not guilty shame, dishonest shame of nature's works, honorable, honor, dishonorable, sin bred. How have ye troubled all mankind with shows instead? mere shows of seeming pure, and banished from man's life, his happiest life, simplicity and spotless innocence. This is a consistent theme. We already saw it in, uh, in the uh, Nativity Ode, but we also saw it in Comus, right? Uh, which is a, is a poem that, um, and, a, and a, a play, if you will, that praises uh, virginity and and uh, celibacy and uh, a rightness, uprightness of character in a young woman. 
so pass they naked on. So again, the nakedness is only one aspect and it contains all manner of other things. So again, in Genesis 2, it just says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. And you could just think that they had no clothes on, which of course they don't because they will later be clothed, but the clothes symbolize something. They clothe, the clothes or the nakedness at the moment is a righteousness. They have a native righteousness about them. And when they lose that, they will have to clothe themselves so that they, their lack of righteousness is not, is not exposed because their minds will be ashamed. So there's a loss that goes beyond a physical manifestation. It's an inner awareness of a lack of sanctity. And so later in scripture, it will talk about being putting on Christ, being clothed in Christ, being in Christ. Lot, lots of language about that, clothed in his righteousness. Not, it's not talking about physical clothing, it's talking about a, a, the mind of Christ and the, and, the, and the holiness that comes from being in, in God or hidden with Christ and God. So lots of description there. Um, Mere shows of seeming pure and banished from man's life is happiest life, simplicity and spotless in it. So pass they naked on, nor shun the sight of God or angel. Uh, where is this? For they thought no ill. So hand in hand they passed. This phrase, hand in hand, keeps getting repeated throughout Paradise Lost. Just note it for yourselves. Hand in hand, hand in hand, hand in hand. Sometimes the hands part. Sometimes the hands hold things. Sometimes they drop things. When they do, it's symbolic. Again, these are just little touches of a master poet. When they leave Paradise Lost, at the end of the book, they walk through Eden, wandering steps and slow hand in hand. That's how they leave. Very important. We first meet them holding hands. I'll pick that up when we come to book nine. We'll note the, the hands again. The loveliest pair that ever since in love's embrace is met. Adam, the goodliest man of men since born his sons, the fairest of her daughters, Eve, under a tuft of shade that on a green stood whispering soft by a fresh mountainside, they sat them down. And after no more toil of their good, their sweet gardening labor than sufficed to recommend cool zephyr and made ease more easy, wholesome thirst and appetite more grateful. To their supper fruits they fell, nectarine fruits which the compliant boughs yielded them. Sidelong as they sat, recline Milton presents nature in the way that we often see in the 17th century, nature actually com being compliant with having and, and almost giving up its fruit. You don't have to take it, it's being given. It's almost like the boughs bow down to them to, so they, you know, they reach up and they come down, here you go. Um, Sidelong as they sat reclined in the soft downy bank, damasked with flowers. Wonderful word. The savory pulp they chew and in the rind, still as they thirsted, scoop the brimming stream. So then they take the, got a cup there nor gentle purpose, nor endearing smiles wanted, nor youthful dalliance, as beseems fair couple, linked in happy nuptial league, alone as they. About them frisking played all beasts of earth, since wild, and of all chase in wood or wilderness, forest or den, sporting the lion ramped, and in his paw dandled the kid. There, there's no predators here. The lion and the lamb, or the lion are, they're playing together. Bears, tigers, ounces, pards, gambled before them the unwieldy elephant. To make them mirth used all his might and wreathed his lithe proboscis. Soon the serpent sly insinuated uh, Insinuating wove with Gordian twine his braided train and of his fatal guile gave proof unheeded. Others on the grass couched and now filled with pasture gazing sat or, or bed were ruminating. And what is Satan's response to this? Oh, hell. 
so the most uh, the this beautiful portrait of unfallen creation and mankind there what's his immediate response it's appropriate uh, ejaculation oh hell what do mine eyes with grief behold into our room of bliss thus high advanced creatures of other mold earthborn perhaps not spirits yet to heavenly spirits bright little inferior whom my thoughts pursue with wonder and could love so lively shines in them divine resemblance and such grace the hand that formed them on their shape hath poured ah gentle pair ye little think how nigh your change approaches when all these delights will vanish and deliver ye to woe more woe the more your taste is now of joy happy but for so happy ill secured long to continue and this high seat your heaven ill fenced for heaven to keep out such a foe as now is entered yet no purposed foe to you whom i could pity thus forlorn though i unpitied league with you i seek what does he want he wants an alliance with them a marriage if you will league with you i seek the mutual enmity so straight so close that i with you must dwell or you with me henceforth my dwelling haply may not please like this fair paradise your sense yet such accept your maker's work he gave it me which i as freely give hell shall unfold to entertain you two her widest gates and send forth all her kings there will be room <coughs> not like these narrow limits to receive your numerous offspring if no better place thank him who puts me loath to this revenge on you who wrong me not for him who wronged and should i at your harmless innocence melt as i do yet public reason just honor an empire with revenge enlarged by conquering this new world compels me now to do what else though damned i should abhor so spake the fiend <coughs> and with necessity the tyrant's plea excused his devilish deeds great summary this is all god's fault he let me hear I'm going to do a bad deed, but not because I really want to, but because I have to. It's for the greater good to do evil and blame somebody else for it. So again, Milton's exploring uh, <coughs> the fallen mind and to some degree the mind of the tyrant. And again, it's political commentary. It's a religious commentary. It's a psychological commentary. It goes all the way down on all of these. Extraordinary. Psychologists could have a field day with this, but what great language. Then from his lofty stand on that high tree, remember the tree of life, down he alights among the sportful herd of those four-footed kinds, himself now one. Now other, as their shape serve best his end, nearer to view his prey, and unespied to mark what of their state he more might learn. By word or action marked about them round, a lion now he stalks with fiery glare, then as a tiger who by chance hath spied in some purlieu two gentle fawns at play straight couches near close then rising changes oft his couchant watch as one who chose his ground whence rushing he might surest seize them both gripped in each paw when adam first of men to first of women eve thus moving speech turned him all ear to hear new utterance flow they haven't spoken yet but now we hear the first speech. Soul partner and soul part of all these joys. Dearer thyself than all. Needs must the power that made us and for us this ample world be infinitely good and of his good as liberal and free as infinite that raised us from the dust and placed us here in all this happiness who at his hand 
have nothing merited, nor can perform aught whereof he hath need. He who requires from us no other service than to keep this one, this easy charge. Of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruit, so various not to taste that only tree of knowledge planted by the tree of life, so near grows death to life, whate'er death is, some dreadful thing, no doubt. For well thou knowest, God hath pronounced it death to taste that tree. The only sign of our obedience left among so many signs of power and rule conferred upon us and dominion given over all other creatures that possess earth, air, and sea. Then let us not think hard one easy prohibition, but let us ever praise him and extol his bounty following our delightful task to prune these growing plants and tend these flowers, which were it toilsome yet with thee were sweet. So it's a, again, he immediately reveals to Satan, who just happens to be there at this point, exactly what he can't do and will do, right? So, okay, um, Milton's trying to cut to the chase here. He doesn't want to just have them talking about any old thing. We'll talk exactly about the thing that you need to know in order to bring us down. First thing he hears, just happens to be about this. To whom thus Eve replied, O thou for whom and from whom? Satan's sort of like a peeping Tom here watching in on them and but we the audience are a bit like satan it, not in the sense that we're peeping toms but we're spectators listening in it's almost like they're on a stage in front of us we're all watching and he's watching along with us and he but he is uh, an actor in the play as well to whom thus eve replied o thou for whom and from whom i was formed flesh of thy flesh and without whom am to no end my guide and head what thou hast said is just and right we for we to him indeed all praises owe and daily thanks i chiefly who enjoy so far the happier lot enjoying thee preeminent by so much odds while thou like consort to thyself canst nowhere find and now she comes into the creation account this is a s splendid account that, d that day do I oft remember, when from sleep I first awaked and found myself reposed under a shade on flowers, much wondering where and what I was, whence thither brought, and how. Not distant far from thence a murmuring sound of waters issued from a cave and spread into a liquid plain, then stood unmoved pure as the expanse of heaven. I thither went with unexperienced thought and laid me down on the green bank to look into the clear, smooth lake that to me seemed another sky. As I bent down to look, just opposite, a shape within the watery gleam appeared bending to look on me. She's uh, alluding to the, uh, the myth of Narcissus. Narcissus is a beautiful uh, uh, being that looks into the water and sees the fairest image that could be seen, namely himself. All the nymphs are in love with Narcissus. And, and he agrees with the nymphs. <laughs> and in, in, in Ovid's Metamorphosis, he falls into the water and dies and so forth. He's so... He's so uh, and so there's an element here of comedy on Milton's part. I think there is a genuine comedy. I don't think he means that she's actually a narcissist, but that she loves the most beautiful thing in all of creation, namely herself. She's entranced by this. And so the humor is that when she meets Adam, he's not quite as attractive as she is, and she runs away from him. It's, and he's like, oh, come back. So again, you, you have to get a sense of uh, that Milton actually has a capacity for humor, even though it's an epic poem. A shape within the watery gleam appeared, bending to look on me, and I started back. It started back, but pleased I soon returned. Pleased it returned as soon with answering looks of sympathy and love. There I had fixed mine eyes till now, and pined with vain desire, had not a voice thus warned me. What thou seest, what there thou seest, fair creature, is thyself. With thee it came and goes 
but follow me, and I will bring thee where no shadow stays thy coming. And thy soft embraces, he whose image thou art, him thou shalt enjoy, inseparably thine. To him shalt bear multitudes like thyself, and thence be called mother of human race. She hears the voice of God telling us, you know, come with me. If you want to see uh, parallels in this in, in Lewis's, um, is it uh, Prince Caspian, whatever, when she looks into the book, sees herself, sees an image of herself that looks like Lucy. Lucy rather looks like Susan. And she sees an image, she loves the image, and she's getting captivated by it, and she hears a voice. You know, stop that. Stop fantasizing that you're, you're, you're focusing on a form of beauty, but it's not the form of the beauty, etc. Again, poets and writers will, will take these passages and amplify them and put them in their own books. This is what good writers actually do, is they interact with other good writers. <coughs> but he, she hears the voice of God here, and again, Milton's not taking this from the Genesis account. There's no such account here. Um, he, he's putting in the place between the creation and Adam seeing. He'll eventually come to that. But so he's, he's expanding on the account. What could I do, said Eve, but follow straight, invisibly thus led, till I espy thee, fair indeed and tall, under a platen? Methought, yet methought less fair, <laughs> less winning soft, less amiably mild then that smooth watery image back i turned thou following criest aloud return fair eve whom fliest thou whom thou fliest of him thou art his flesh his bone to give thee being i lent out of my side to thee nearest my heart substantial life to have thee by my side henceforth an individual soulless dear part of my soul i seek thee and thee claim my other half with that, thy gentle hand seized mine. I yielded, and from that time, see how beauty is excelled by manly grace and wisdom, which alone is truly fair. So she speaks in love language, the same way we read in song of uh, songs and so forth. Right? She thinks he is her superior. He, in some sense, sees her as his superior, in, in some sense because they, they're delighted, they're made for each other, but they're not the same. Milton's, and we will find what we don't ex necessarily expect, we find sex in Paradise Lost, right here. <coughs> Milton is at pains to put this in here because some of the church fathers in their adherence to paganism thought that the body was the cause of sin and regarded the bodies as uh, evil in some ways. Milton's at pains to show that the, that the body is not the source of evil, it's disobeying God that is, and that uh, it isn't transmitted through sex furthermore. So therefore, puts this passage in, so spake our general mother, and with eyes of conjugal attraction, unreproved, and meek surrender, half embracing, leaned on our first father, half her swelling breast naked met, his under the flowing gold of her loose tresses hid. He in delight both of her beauty and submissive charms smiled with superior love as Jupiter on Juno smiles, while he impregns the clouds that shed May flowers and pressed her matron lip with kisses pure. Aside, the devil turned for envy, yet with jealous leer malign eyed them askance and to himself thus plained. Sight, hateful, sight tormenting. Thus these two imparadised in one another's arms. The happier Eden shall enjoy their fill of bliss on bliss, while I to hell am thrust, where neither joy nor love, but fierce desire among our other torments, not the least, still unfulfilled with pain of longing pines. Yet let me not forget what I have gained from their own mouths. All is not theirs, it seems. One fatal tree there stands of knowledge called, forbidden them to taste. Knowledge forbidden, suspicious, reasonless. Why should their Lord envy them that? 
Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? And do they only stand by ignorance? Is that their happy state, the proof of their obedience and their faith? Oh, fair foundation laid whereon to build their ruin. Hence, I will excite their minds with more desire to know and to reject envious commands, invented with design to keep them low, whom knowledge might exalt equal with God's, aspiring to be such, they taste and die. What likelier can ensue? So this is a crucial narrative action in, in book four right here. <clears throat> uh, they will be led to question the rational basis of what is deliberately on God's part without any reason being given. There's no reason for it. It's a prohibition. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes, the, that's the description of it. It is that, but it's not told why they're forbidden to do it. It's just a, an order. No reason. And they're capable of reasoning, but here there is no reason for it. It's just they must obey. And why would they obey? Because they love God. Such he formed them. And for that reason. But they're going to be led through a, a reasoning process. Why? And, and so let me lead them down the path of knowledge towards their doom. But first, with the narrow search, I must walk around this garden and no corner left leave unspied a chance but chance may lead where i may meet some wandering spirit of heaven by fountain side or in thick shade retired from him to draw what further would be learned live while ye may yet happy pair enjoy till i return short pleasures for long woes are to succeed so saying his proud step he scornful turn but with sly circumspection and began through would through waste or hill or dale his roam. <clears throat> so he sees that, note that he sees the human pair in conjugal bliss, sex. He, he, he watches it and he is outraged, incensed. Again, it's an <clears throat> extraordinary passage and so is his response. This is the thing that most upsets him. So he turns around and he goes looking for someone. And who does he come across other than Uriel, whom we had already heard about, 555. Uriel gliding through the even on a sunbeam, swift as a shooting star. In autumn thwarts the night, that is across it, when vapors fired impress the air and shows the mariner from what point of his compass to beware impets, impetuous winds, he thus began in haste. Gabriel, to thee thy course by lot hath given charge and strict watch that to this happy place no evil thing approach or enter in. This day at height of noon came to my sphere a spirit, zealous as he seemed to know more of the Almighty's works, and chiefly man, God's latest image. I describe this way. That was back in book three. I didn't actually account for that. Um, in book three, there was an encounter between Uriel and Satan, and he directed him his way. He was disguised at that point. And Uriel, even as, as clear sight as he was, could not spot Satan at, for whom he was. He was deceived at that point. He told them where Adam and Eve were. But, but then thereafter, when he actually got to the earth, he disfigured himself out of envy and rage, and Uriel saw that then. So now he goes to Gabriel and says, But in the mount that lies from Eden north, when, where he first lighted, soon discerned his looks alien from heaven, with passions full obscured. Mine eye pursued him still, but under shade lost sight of him. One of the banished crew, I fear, hath ventured from the deep to raise new troubles. Him thy care must be to find. To whom thus the winged warrior thus returned. Uriel, no wonder if thy perfect sight, amid the sun's bright circle where thou sits, see far and wide in at this gate, none pass the vigilance here placed, but such as come well known from heaven. And since meridian hour no creature thence, if spirit of other sort, 
so minded have o'erleaped these earthly bounds on purpose, hard thou knowest it to exclude spiritual substance with corporeal bar. But if within the circuit of these walks, in whatever shape he lurk, of whom thou tellest by morrow dawning, I shall know. So promised he. And so he goes off. And he goes in search of Satan, not knowing it is Satan, but knowing that it is a spirit from hell. And we come back to the human pair. Adam speaking to Eve. Comments or questions at this point, by the way. It's an extraordinary passage. I think it's, it's, it's little read comparatively, and yet it's the, it's the finest poetry. The narrative is clear, compelling. It doesn't drag at all. There's no wasted lines. Uh, important what he tells as well about human dignity, about human knowledge. Note how they address one another as a king and a queen. Very courtly language. There's nothing uh, for the nakedness. There's no corruption there. There's no sense of, um, of human sinfulness in their dialogue as well. So Adam, when he speaks here, again, fair consort, the hour of night and all things now retired to rest, minded us of like repose. Since God hath set labor and rest as day and night to men successive and the timely dew of sleep now falling with soft, slumbrous weight inclines our eyelids. Other creatures all day long rove idle, unemployed, and less need rest. Man hath his daily work of body or mind appointed, which declares his dignity and the regard of heaven on all his ways. Note then he is verifying the importance of work, his dignity in his work. Again, if you look at the pagan accounts, they say that work is the product of the fall. It, it comes after that. Before that, again, they have a view of the golden age where, th where the fruits offer themselves into the, into the hands, just like we saw here. But here they, uh, they account work to be a product of the fall in the silver age and so forth. So it's only a curse. Not so in the biblical account. Milton follows that here. These are not small things. Um, your attitudes towards work and rest and so forth. Note that both of them are important. While other animals enact a range and of their doings, God, ta God takes no account. Tomorrow air fresh morning streak the east with first approach of light. We must be risen and at our pleasant labor to reform yon flowery arbors, yonder alleys green, our walks at noon with branches overgrown that mock our scant manuring and require more hands than ours to lop their wanton growth. Those blossoms also, and those dropping gums that lie bestrewn unsightly and unsmooth, ask riddance if we mean to tread with ease. Meanwhile, as nature wills, to tread with ease. Or to, night bids us rest, rather. So they have work to do. And if they don't do it, the garden is just, it's so fertile and luxuriant that it will overgrow and become difficult for them so we have to keep things in order remember the charge of adam here in the garden is to tend and to keep the garden very important part of the dominion mandate to keep keeping uh, has the connotations of keeping the evil out by the way not just doing agriculture and remember, this is man who's given the charge. Eve's not yet there. Now, of course, she gets implicated in it, but the he is given the charge to protect, be vigilant. <clears throat> to whom thus Eve with perfect beauty adorned, my author and disposer, what thou bidst, unargued I obey. So God ordains. God is thy law, thou mine. To know no more is woman's happiest knowledge and her praise. With thee conversing, I forget all time. All seasons and their change, all pleas alike. Sweet is the breath of morn, her rising sweet. With charm of earliest birds, pleasant the sun, when first on his delightful land he spreads his orient beams on herb, tree, fruit, and flower. Glistering with dew, fragrant the fertile earth after soft showers, and sweet 
the coming on of grateful evening mild. Then silent night with her solemn bird and this fair moon and these the gems of heaven, her starry train. But neither breath of morn when she ascends with charm of earliest words, nor rising sun on this delightful land, nor herb fruit flower glistering with dew, nor fragrance after showers, nor grateful evening mild, nor silent night with his, this her solemn bird, nor walk by moon or glittering starlight without thee is sweet. So all of these things, and note that there's a catalog of them and there's a keep right, and I, I deliberately emphasize this is a catalog here, but none of these are sweet compared without you. They're not, so again, the with thee. But wherefore all night long shine these for whom this glorious sight when sleep hath shut all eyes? To whom our general ancestor thus replied, daughter of God and man, accomplished Eve. So she said that he, he, she said that he was her author. He corrects her. She's saying it out of gratitude, out of respect, whatever. It's not entirely accurate. She knows it's not entirely accurate. It's love language, right? It's praise. To whom our general ancestor replied, daughter of God and man, accomplished Eve, those have their course to finish round the earth by morrow evening and from land to land in order, though to nations yet unborn, ministering in order, though to nations yet unborn, ministering light prepared, they set and rise, lest total darkness should by night regain her old possession and extinguish life in nature and all things. So now he's talking about the separation of the day and the night. The whole earth doesn't get enclosed in darkness at one point and in light at once. So there's, he talks about the way the sun moves around and, and draws a spiritual implication of this. Remember, God separated the light from the darkness and darkness has connotations of evil even there in the beginning. Not that it is evil, but it has the connotations and because it will destroy life. If it's total darkness, life cannot exist. But with kindly heat of various influence, foment and warm, temper or nourish or in part shed down their stellar virtue in all kinds that grow on earth, made hereby after to receive perfection from the sun's more potent ray. These then, though unbeheld in deep of night, shine not in vain, nor think though men were none, that heaven would want spectators. God want praise. Millions of spiritual creatures walk the earth unseen, both when we wake and when we sleep. All these with ceaseless praise his works behold, both day and night. How often from the steep of echoing hill or thicket have we heard celestial voices to the midnight air, soul or responsive each to other's notes, singing their great creator. Often bands while they keep watch or nightly rebounding walk with heavenly touch of instrumental sounds in full harmonic number joined. Their songs divide the night and lift our thoughts to heaven. Thus talking hand in hand alone they passed on to their blissful bower. Don't follow us, animals. It was a place chosen by a sovereign planter when he framed all things to man's useful boy, a use, a delightful use of the roof of the thickest covert with inwoven shade, laurel and myrtle and so forth. Um, I think I'm running out of time or run out of time. Uh, but the portrait is, is, is beautiful and he concludes here, at least the conclusion of the passage that I'm going to be able to deal with, uh, with the understanding of uh, the way in which the nature of things reflects God's goodness as well. And most importantly, a little bit of information here, that God does not need man to praise him. He already has praise and love. Mankind is, to, is invited as one that bears God's image to the general praise. But there's not an absence in God that we fill. He doesn't lack anything in himself. The creation is of his soul goodness. And for that reason alone, it's not to create um, an audience for himself as if he were lacking something that we're going to give to him. Uh, that will become the accusation of, uh, of Satan and others. That God has a need for love. God never suffers from need love. He's all gift love.
right? And uh, whereas we are needy as well as giving. Anyway, enough of that for now. We'll move on next time to the look at the, at, at the war in heaven. So we'll go back and it chronologically we'll back, go back to the beginning of the account that precedes chronologically where we begin the epic with Satan and his fallen angels in hell. We'll, that, this, this will, even though it happens in book five, it's chronologically prior to it. Okay.